Example number two, stealing Bitcoin without the private key. You'd think it would be impossible, right? Wasn't there like a diagram at one point with like a giant sun saying that you'd need like a Dyson sphere around the sun and you'd have to do all this stuff? Uh, so example number one was basic and inevitable and it was very, it's very serious. But this one is deliberately kind of contrived and kind of unlikely and kind of um, fatuous for lack of a better word. This is just me having fun, so feel free to skip this video in its entirety if you just if you're not into that kind of thing but I just thought I'd have a little bit of fun and see how far can I how far can I push the boundaries of as far as permissionless implementation and turn completeness go so so here's the claim you ready I'm gonna steal Bitcoin and disable turn completeness and all I need is a one turn complete sidechain uh, with the assumptions I made before in section one. So how am I going to execute on this claim? I'm going to force miners to steal 1% of all outstanding Bitcoins, 210,000. So, like, for example, the Winklevoss twins could lose all of their Bitcoin. I'm not going to reduce everyone's balance by just 1%. I'm going to take 1% of the total from, uh, from an unknown group of people. So that's the execution. And what is my strategy going to be It's taken generally? Well, I'm going to create a near copy of Bitcoin. And I'm going to free up 1% of the Bitcoin over there. And those can be claimed by the miners if they help me. And by helping me, they will end up disabling the original Bitcoin completely and everything attached to it. So that's, that's the general strategy. So here are some tools to help us uh, accomplish this task. Here's a diagram over here. This is Bitcoin 1, what I'm going to call Bitcoin 1. This is the side chain that is Turing complete and has all the flexibility and permissionlessness. Uh, this is the Ethereum type thing. In here, Ethereum or whatever thing is making uh, other new contracts, new side chains, which are necessarily attached to Bitcoin 1. And one of them is what I'm going to call Bitcoin 2, which is going to be our replacement candidate with the Bitcoin stolen. That's We're going to go from 1 to 2. So a really simple assumption is that it's possible to program Bitcoin 2 so that it, it can watch Bitcoin 1. Uh, if these are going to be merged mined, it's going to be basically a requirement that that's true. But even now, there are things in Ethereum called the Bitcoin Relay and other stuff. So this is very trivial. Since Bitcoin 2 can watch Bitcoin 1, you can make events in Bitcoin 2 depend on events in Bitcoin 1. And one example of that is that it's possible to more or less instantly move Bitcoin from Bitcoin 1 to Bitcoin 2. So you do some fancy trick with them on Bitcoin 1, and they freeze. And then on Bitcoin 2 they show up. It's a little bit harder to move them back, which is the point of tool number two, which I'm going to call the half surrender, which is a recyclable two-way peg. Now let me explain this very slowly because it's pretty important. Every two months there's one special block in B2, known in advance, where if you do something on B1, you get Bitcoin over there. You execute on this more general principle. Now, here's the complex part. These minted coins can move freely throughout B2 as if they were normal Bitcoins, as long as their parent coins have not moved twice. If the parent coins move twice, then these shut off. You can't move them anymore. So what's the point of that? Well, the point is you get one free move on here. So you can move your coins over to Bitcoin 2, but you still get one free move on Bitcoin 1. And you can either burn the coins on Bitcoin 1, at which point you've committed to 2, or you can just move twice and you can take back your move. You can take back your move to B2. So yeah, you can kind of lock them in stasis between 1 and 2, and you can defer your actual decision until later. But you have a, a small problem, a time problem, because after 99% of the transfer process has been completed, i.e. after 2 has 99% of the coins. You can't do this anymore. So you don't want to be the last guy and so notice that we so notice that we already have a dominant strategy for bitcoin owners. So the people who hold bitcoin in other words, which is that they should always have surrender at every opportunity. Because as long as they conform to this strategy, they can't lose anything. If my attack succeeds, they can just burn the coins on B1 at which point they become fully active on B2 permanently and other people will accept them as valuable tokens.
Uh, in fact, what will actually happen is people would upgrade their software and they wouldn't even notice what was going on. But this would be happening behind the scenes. And if, if the attack fails, B2 loses, all they have to do is send the coins to themselves a few times or just do nothing. It doesn't matter. They, so they can't lose as long as they follow this strategy of half surrendering. So that's nice. So we've already got the coin owners. Now we just need a critical mass of miners, and we'll, we'll have already succeeded in our quest. And so we got some more tools for the miners. That's tool number three, a forced dilemma. After a certain network time is reached, Bitcoin 2 needs one of these conditions to be met. Either Bitcoin 2 is empty, either, you know, it's the end of the road for Bitcoin 2, it's always empty and never updates, or Bitcoin 1 is complying with an arbitrary soft fork defined in the software. And in this way, B2 can ask B1 to perform any soft fork. If the miners care a lot about B2, and they don't particularly care about the soft fork, B1, you can really kind of almost force miners to engage with you with this process. And the thing is, you can do an awful lot of stuff with a, a soft fork of Bitcoin, it turns out. So this is a very powerful kind of uh, request that we can make, we can have the software make to the miners. Tool number four, this thing, the end game payout, it's going to pay X coins on B2 to Y recipients, conditional on some future block being reached. So we have block here, block here, block here, block here, blocks everywhere. And once we reach this block, whatever happened in here, there'll be some giant payout to some address in this block. Y recipients will receive money, they'll get X coins. Now this is actually our last tool, but it's a little complicated to explain how we choose X and Y, so I hope you'll pay attention and pause the video if you get a little overheated. As I've already explained, the X is going to be 1% of the currently outstanding Bitcoin. We want it to be large enough to be enticing. We want it to be small enough to make the victims ignorable. We want everyone to say, you know, you know, I feel bad for your loss, but it's not my problem. You know, you were warned, etc. So we don't want anyone to really care about it this too much, but we want it to be we want it to be an inducement. Why recipients is going to get a little complicated. Again, we still need to bribe the miners. So we want to only pay the miners who help us out. So how do we pull that off? Well, I say we recruit miners which help us early on. And we want to recruit miners in an ambiguous way so that they have plausible deniability. And I'll explain why I've chosen these two factors in a moment. But first I'm going to explain how we recruit them. And that is that we're going to generate a second coin type, which I'm going to call compliance credits, or CCs. They're going to be created at a certain point in time. This, this is time. As we move from left to right, this is a time axis. So here the, the compliance credits are going to be created. They're going to be awarded to miners based on stuff, events that happen in B1, it's going to be awarded on B2. And then, when we have our deterministic payout, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to destroy all the compliance credits, and they're all going to be redeemed for Bitcoin on B2. So that is the mechanism by which I'm going to entice the miners. So I'm now going to explain these two factors here, early rule compliance and ambiguity, they are very important. So I'm going to explain them in a lot of detail now. So first, it's trivial to identify the miners by just giving by just using the Coinbase transaction. So we know who they are. So we can pay them. <laughs> so that's that part's easy. So we just and we know uh, how early we are because that's what blockchains do is they sort things based on time. Early on in the process we award more CCs per block. You get a lot of CCs per block here, and then as the attack kind of moves forward through time, this tapers off. Very simple. In this way, you want to get involved earlier rather than later. Okay, so that's how we reward early adopters. But how do we achieve ambiguity? Well, first of all, ignore this temporarily. If you're watching this presentation for the second time, you'll know what this means, but just ignore it for now. To achieve ambiguity, we're going to use, for every block in B1, we're going to use the hash to get some kind of random sorting of the UTXO set on B1. 
So everyone in Bitcoin has like a checking account and we're going to put all the checking accounts in a deck and we are going to shuffle the deck and then we're going to draw out the top beta percent frozen. So maybe we'll shuffle the deck and we'll draw out the top 10%. We're going to draw out these uh, checking accounts and they're going to be designated as frozen accounts. They're not literally going to be frozen, but if anything is spent from them, the miners don't get their compliance credits. So they're not literally frozen, but we're asking them to be temporarily frozen for one block. And remember, in the next block, it's going to be a completely new shuffling of the deck. So miners have a lot of plausible deniability, because in each single block, an individual UTXO is very unlikely to be spent. So even if the someone tries to spend from the UTXO, miners have a lot of excuses. They can just say that they didn't get the transaction or that the transaction fee was too small. Plausible deniability is like the, the theme of Byzantine fault tolerance, which is the problem that Bitcoin addresses. So it's getting a little more complicated now, so I hope you're still with me on this. But we're going for something that's tunably ambiguous. So we don't, we don't just want it to be ambiguous, but we want it to begin to be am ambiguous. And then we want it to later lose this ambiguity. First, we want to address this word, and later we're going to address this word over here. Okay? And why are we addressing these words? I'll read it to you. Any identifiable miners who are being purposefully malicious are likely to suffer retribution in some form or another. Maybe social, they might get assassinated, <laughs> you know, they could, it could just be economic that people abandon them, or there could be shame. But whatever it is, if they're identifiable and they're being purposefully malicious, there's going to be some pain for them, which we want, as the attacker, we want to alleviate this pain. We want to make it painless. So what I'm saying is, at first, it's going to be very ambiguous. So we won't know if the miners are doing this on purpose. We won't know if they're doing anything on purpose. However, later, the attack will reach a kind of inevitable point where it, it must succeed with inevitability. And so since it's the, the success is now inevitable, there's nothing malicious about sort of continuing the attack or allowing it to finish. What we want is for people to say that, uh, you know, it's too late, what do you want me to do? I'm losing money here, etc. So we want, so we're going to split this, this hurdle, which is, a, it's a difficult hurdle to jump, but we're going to split it into two hurdles, which collectively are easier to jump. We're going to get the miners invested while it's ambiguous, and then we're going to pay them off when it's no longer ambiguous. So again, just to go through this diagram, so here's beta. Like I was saying, the top beta percent of the deck are frozen. So when beta is at 100%, we have succeeded, and Bitcoin 1 is shut off. And then here's some other value. I mean, I don't know how likely an individual UTXO is to be spent, but I would imagine that at around this value, you, probably no one would really notice anything specific. The attack would be beginning here with a lot of ambiguity, but then ultimately it would reach as beta increases in our evil Bitcoin 2 contract, it would eventually increase to the point where the attack must succeed. And then it would no longer be malicious. It would be purposeful. You would know that the miners were involved, but it would be kind of a nothing we can do about it scenario. So what's the dominant strategy for the miners now? Well, it's to create many different Bitcoin 2s, lots of them, each, each of them their own, many, with many different seeds. Uh, I asked you to ignore this later, but this is this random seeds for sorting the, the UTXOs. So now we are going to create lots and lots and lots of these, and they will accrue through no virtue of their own, purely in a luck basis. They will accrue these compliance credits. These new gravitational, what I'm going to call gravitational center, will emerge and attract miners. Because there will be some groups of miners that have a lot, of, a high percentage of hash rate, and they also have, between them, a lot of compliance credits. On, on, on one or two or three or four of these, there will, will be a Bitcoin 2 where they have all this money. And these miners will have a vested interest in the attack succeeding now. If they don't join a coalition, and they want to join a coalition, if they don't join one soon, the deck might shuffle against them. And by that I mean, if they might, they might be wanting this one to be the real Bitcoin 2 that the miners go with. But it might, there might be another one that's very close. 
and miners might cut deals with each other, and then they'll make this one the winning one or something like that. And by cut deals, I mean they can literally pay each other Bitcoin or compliance credits or something to switch allegiance, which I think they will do once there's 210,000 Bitcoin up for grabs. The deal here, and recall that if miners aren't interested in this, they don't lose anything, right? They don't. They just kind of are running the software and very little changes for them. So they, if a miner is uninterested in this, they can remain just kind of bored or kind of they can abstain from this. Uh, that that doesn't harm the attack. So what happens as a result is that one one of these emerges as the new Bitcoin. It eclipsed everything here in Bitcoin One and everything attached to it, disabling the Turing completeness, as I argued. Now, this is a kind of an important point because someone might say that will never happen, Paul, because the precedent will uh, ruin everyone's faith in Bitcoin or whatever. So I've actually set the attack up relying on that premise. So I had originally d done the attack a slightly different way, but I've actually changed it around so that I've left it inherently open to repeat. By leaving it open to attack, I'm, I'm, I'm actually punting that problem to the agents who will themselves disable it. And so as a result, I meet my second condition that I was going to disable Turing completeness slash permissionless implementation. And I did that by omitting something. I actually changed this attack around a little bit to leave it more open-ended, knowing that the agents themselves will shut this off. So anyway, I mean, that's uh, that was this example. And again, it's not, it's not supposed to be taken completely seriously, but it is... Uh, it is, um, it's not supposed to be taken completely seriously, it's just kind of an example of how, how far things can go. And I wanted to take them to the, to the ac absolutely unforgivable limit of stealing the Bitcoins, and uh, that's what I wanted to do. So, Oh, and I actually I would like to say one thing, uh, I, I would like to mention one more thing, uh, just as a detail. Uh, the miners can actually choose who it is they steal the Bitcoins from. Because the way this attack works, um, in theory, of course, it's only going to happen once. Because afterwards, all this sidechains, turn completeness, uh, smart contract stuff will be disabled. It will be back to being only Bitcoin. Since they have only one, they have a crazy opportunity to do this, and there's no, it's just one event, and there's not going to be any ongoing reputation to ruin or, or bartering to take place. The miners can actually choose, right? Because since miners can filter things out of Bitcoin One, they can filter, they can select the addresses that have one percent of the Bitcoin, and they can just, they could, if they wanted to, they could just refuse to allow those to move ever, and then those people would be unable to half surrender, and then it would be their Bitcoin that would be stolen. So the miners can actually choose; they have the option of choosing who will suffer. Uh, the loss of their bitcoins. So I just thought I'd mention that because it's it's like not only is it like the worst case scenario, so to speak, but it's it's exactly what people often complain about uh, with respect to side chains or SPV security. So I've achieved the exact same terror on the main chain, the Bitcoin one, just by adding things, and that is the whole point.